for some time I've been doing programming that uh, requires uh, participants to participate by adding color to images that we provide. Um, you know, in old, old times and maybe even now today, they consider that coloring. I think things like textile work, knitting, crocheting, weaving, um, needlepoint, uh, paper mache. So when you think about uh, jewelry, jewelry making, because that's what I do, in some cultures it is a fine art, in other cultures it's just a craft, just something as a hobby to get by with. With me being a poet, the thing that comes to mind is um, how spoken word is viewed sometimes in, in academic circles. So uh, spoken word and performative poetry has become very popular over the past several years. When you talk to certain people in academic circles, um, they do not give spoken word the same level of respect that they do um, what would be termed academic poetry or traditional poetry or poetry that is written primarily for publication. My grandma would make sombreros and she would go into this little cave and it was really humid down there so they helped her you know do all the sombreros and stuff like that but that's that was like an everyday kind of thing it was more of a job. In Uruguay where I'm from both my parents used to make baskets from the natural occurring flora of the area that we were living in. And my dad and I would get on a bus and just go to whichever state we chose to that, that particular day and we would sell these baskets. Work, you know, whether it's ceramic or whether it's tin work or whether it's weaving and things like that, that, um, that from a cultural standpoint, it's, it's more of a craft. But scrapbooking can be considered a craft in one culture and an art in another. So yeah, I, I think that, that quilting to some would probably be, um, you know, a hobby or whatever. Um, but I, I've seen a lot of quilts that are just beautiful, that are inspiring, that tell a story about a family. The field that I'm in, we do a lot of uh, creative placemaking projects. Uh, uh, we do them as part of the extended day programming in Wyandotte County, uh, after school programming and, and dealing with uh, issues like social justice. Uh, we also uh, uh, facilitate these type programs in community centers and detention facilities. Um, there is some cultural overlap from time to time because a lot of the young people we work with over in Wyandotte County are Hmong and Hispanic, uh, some of which are still developing their English speaking language. We try and do a little uh, research and integrate things that are familiar to them in their original uh, uh, cultures so that they feel uh, a part, that the, that, that the process that they're working on is relevant to them. Or, you know, art and culture making. Uh, is as a curator. Uh, I take art, you know, or I intake art from artists from different cultures and like across different cultures um, and different groups and put them all into one space. So there's a lot of like just juxtaposition that may happen. There are lots of little, little stories that happen within one single exhibition because there are, um, there's art included from so many different types of people all at once, and it all has to kind of come together. So those cultures and those perspectives are always kind of intermingling. So at Arts in Prison, we offer programs in, uh, in um, music, making music, writing music, music theory. We have uh, two choirs, a men's choir at the men's prison and a women's choir at the women's prison. We do creative writing, everything from memoirs, short stories, poetry. We have performing arts classes. We do playwriting. The men put on um, actual plays. Um, we've offered dinner theater. We have drawing, painting, knitting, crocheting. We facilitate the making of art and culture because we're, we're bringing in instructors, we're bringing in supplies and materials, we're giving men and women the opportunity to create. 
um, to express themselves in an artistic manner, whether it's visual art or writing or creating music? We, we started like around, I think three years ago, showing, um, showing artwork in different barbershops and salons first and being able to create a space for people to come, living, you know, just experiencing a, a everyday, a normal life. You know, going to the barbershop salon is a normal thing in the black community. And being able to create spaces for, for them to experience art in such a familiar place has been very beneficial because I don't believe that we're, we're used to going places and experiencing art and buying art. So it's like bringing the art to you. You know, and it's been very educational, really showing people about black artists, about that, that they're alive and well and producing and inspiring, bringing the awareness to them wanting art in their home or even desiring to be artists themselves. I consider my art, myself an artist, even though my palette is healthcare, <laughs> because I'm sculpting new ways of delivering health care in a way that's culturally uh, appropriate and celebrative. So, so my, for me, my art is, is creating health care models that make sense for black folks. On another level, uh, we, we absolutely recognize the importance of creating beautiful environments for healthcare that include the artwork of the local artist. So our building, just like my home, is filled with the artwork of local African American artists. And that's important for us to have that in the space. And that comes in many forms. We have sculptures, we have paintings, we have photography, uh, and soon we'll have a quilt <laughs> uh, designed by a local black quilt maker. Uh, so beautifying healthcare spaces uh, with uh, local black art is a high priority of ours. So when you think about culture, once again, I have access to, and I'm around painters, poets, uh, authors, music, uh, musicians, of course, jewelry makers, um, quilters. So I have all these people in these arts that are around me that I have opportunity to collaborate with. And we collaborate in spaces that are the non-traditional spaces. When I actually have an opportunity to runway, you never know where it's gonna be. We might do a runway outside in the middle of the street. It could be in an old building that's in, under construction. It could be in a beautiful museum. So again, looking and not limiting myself to just what I know and reaching out and joining in with others has been my greatest opportunities. Obviously poetry is uh, the medium that I am currently working in, I am very much enamored with visual art. Um, I'm not good at it though. And so I discovered ekphrastic poetry, which is a style of poetry that is um, inspired by visual art or visual image. Um, and so for the past 10 plus years, I've been writing poems that uh, were inspired by um, artwork and I really found that to, to push me in a different direction. Um, I also, in terms of encouraging people uh, to write, particularly young people, um, I facilitated more poetry writing and performance workshops than I can count. Um, I am the artistic director and co-founder of Louder Than a Bomb KC, which started back in 2013. And so uh, we've worked with high schools all over the area uh, who have teams of four to six poets that perform their original spoken word poetry. Um, I take a group of students every year uh, to an international poetry festival called Brave New Voices. Um, I've done a lot with area libraries and schools uh, with, with all different backgrounds. I even have worked with um, an organization here called Restart, and uh, they set up a series of workshops um, for um, the unhoused. 
also collaborate a lot with local musicians. You know, I worked at the American Jazz Museum and hosted a op monthly open mic called Jazz Poetry Jams. The overlaying part of, of art as I see it with different cultures, uh, we, we tend to do that quite a bit with our murals. Um, we integrate a lot of uh, different forms of art, may that be culinary or dresses, um, just different elements of cultural, the, the culture of experience, whatever that culture may be, we try to integrate that in all the uh, murals that, that we do. Uh, and it's all based on, you know, the, uh, the demographics of the area, the people that actually live there, and f that we feed off of that culture. Here, in the work that I do at Maddie Rhodes, I um, have a, a really good pulse, I think, on all cultures. You know, we try our best to really be open and understanding, and, and when we're creating works of art with children, uh, making sure that we represent not just this, the one form of art or craftsmanship from Mexico, but but really try to do our best in, 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 in bringing out other, other cultures. In my own practice, the work that I do here, you know, the information and resources that I have available to artists that I'm working very closely with that are showing in our gallery or I'm giving them access and hopefully good resource to other places and other spaces and other um, opportunities that may come up depending on you know the situation maybe it's a mural and being able to say oh well i know muralists and let me let me give you their name for poetry for personal power we work with all artists so whether they are visual artists performing artists um it, it doesn't have to stick directly to poetry um the thing here is can you say your message of resilience and do the craft the passion that i have now is you know reaching out to veterans with PTSD and you know teaching them an eight-week course that is art meditation mindfulness uh, we created a program for teens in transition which is uh, young people who are at a high risk of, of uh, committing a crime or having a crime committed against them um, and so we try and design the program uh, uh, taking into consideration that a lot of these young people are on a great level of learning that is uh, quite a bit under what they uh, should be. And so in order for them to access the process, we have to be sensitive to those uh, reality. If we have another artist who, um, who lost someone right before the pandemic and she used art to help herself work, to help work through that grief. Um, so, you know, she said there was a lot of crying and screaming, but as she made this piece, she was able to work out and purge some of the, you know, some of the feelings, some of the emotions that she had around it. The making of art is vital, and it's vital to a person's mental health and well-being. I witness all the time the remarkable way that art helps men and women deal with stress. Um, it's, it, there's no way when you're painting that you can't, you don't become introspective. In my health, when it comes to art creating and just the impact that it's had on my mental health, um, emotional health, I've learned that art allows you to express yourself and get to a better experience or a deeper experience with self. Um, and it allows, it kind of really guides you to accepting and loving yourself. So through art for me, it's definitely, it's definitely guided me to see the light within myself. Um, during one of our doula classes, the instructors uh, <clears throat> were t was teaching about reproductive parts, body parts. And for homework, she asked the students to go home and write a letter to their womb. So, all the letters were really different. Some were really funny, some were really poignant, uh, but there was one student who had a lot of trauma, uh, was a, a sexual violence survivor, and uh, really was able to be expressive in her letter to her womb uh, in a way that you could see 
was helping her to process and bring healing. Art is expression of what your emotion is. So for my pieces, you might see something really large and wild and crazy, and then you see something very delicate and small. And I learned from um, the one of the artist collectives that I'm with, I learned from them from a workshop that they had sponsored was I wouldn't work when I was down, and I call it quiet. When I was in a quiet place, I wouldn't work. And now I've learned that I have to work during those times because not only does it pull you out mentally, but your your um, brain waves are in a different place. So you're going to create something totally different than what you've been accustomed to creating. And, and then you are able to expand and grow and people are drawn to you that maybe weren't drawn to you before. One, one particular example um, comes to mind. Uh, I think of a student that I ran into at a poetry reading that was uh, in an adult venue. And so this young lady got up and performed an incredible poem. And I wanted to invite her to a jazz poetry jams, the uh, poetry reading that I was hosting uh, at the time. And in the conversation, I found out she was only 16 years old. And so um, at that point, I was also working with a group of uh, high school students over uh, on the Kansas side with a program I was the director of called the Urban Transcendence Poetry Project. And so when I found out she was 16, I was like, well, you know, you probably shouldn't even be in this space. You, she already knew that. Uh, I said, but I do uh, have a program that I think you would really enjoy. Um, as it turns out, she uh, went to school over in Kansas and uh, we got her plugged in. But I later found out that she had been expelled from three schools prior to the school that she was attending at the time, um, that she had, for lack of a better way to put it, a history of violence. Um, and was really struggling with some, some pretty deep anger issues. And uh, she participated in uh, our year in performance, which is kind of the, the culminating event we called it Bring in the Heat. Her mom came up to me afterwards in tears and said, you know, I just want to thank you for saving my daughter's life. And while that might sound a little extreme, I think she was being very sincere in that once her daughter had a way to channel that anger. Yeah, it just seemed to, to, to redirect uh, her and her uh, performance in school. And Our very first mural, um, Isaac and I had the opportunity to work with KCPS at Richardson, Richardson Early Learning Center, Learning Center. And um, an artist had dropped out, and so they asked us to fill us in, um, yeah. So we had uh, to choose specific colors for this project uh, because they would bring kids into this room and to calm down, but the, the, the walls were basically just all white. It was more like a, I don't know, I would call it like a cell kind of thing. But um, in order for us to make it more peaceful, more, you know, peaceful in general, we had to make it uh, Kind of bright, I guess you could say, but we, we, we had certain colors. We had blues, we had the ocean specifically, because you know, here in the ocean and seeing the ocean is very calming. So those were some of the elements that we put together for that. Well, and what we provide here and what we've been doing for a long time, actually, this program is based around working with the younger child, right? So so that by the time this is the the true intent of when it was first started 50 years ago was to make sure to have um the younger child have a place to come and feel comfortable and create artwork so that they have a, sen a, a, a sense of being and and if art is that format to get there then by the time they reach middle and high school they will make better decisions and so in the 1970s you know a lot of um at risk or however you want to say it young people um, dropping out of high school so there was a high school right down the street and and so they they saw that as a really an important thing of okay if we're not working with the high school students how can we work with these younger students it's so important to be able to have to give children an outlet and and not only a creative outlet which is very important 
but just a safe environment, right? And that, that, that there's things that are available for them that maybe they won't have at home and, and that they can do those things without messing up their mom's table or whatever it is. Watching people be able to work through divorce, um, through trauma with their writing, just being able to peel back the layers of the onion and work through and become, walk in the self that they want to present, right? Um, sometimes we go through trauma and it ch changes, it shakes us, and we no longer have a grip on the person that we want to be or to present. Um, doing that kind of work, letting people know that, hey, editing is part of the work. And when you're the writer, you get to control what comes out and what stays in. I don't say this flippantly or joking or anything else, but art literally saved my life. Uh, I was, because of my PTS, uh, PTSD, I was suicidal. And my wife was on a women's trip to Mexico, you know, business trip with uh, a bunch of ladies. And so I was at home by myself. And I just, I melted down. And my mother called like at the right moment because I, I was about to end it all. And she called me, she said, I know you're struggling. I know you're stressed out. Um, remember that painting you did for me when you were 15? It's still hanging in my house. I said, yeah, mom, I remember. She said, can you paint something else? You got time, Trisha's out of town, you know? And it, it stopped me long enough to get angry. I was mad at my mom, because she had stopped me, you know, from killing myself. And so I went to Hobby Lobby and I bought a bunch of supplies and I threw a tarp down in the garage and I just started painting. And, uh, you know, 13 hours later and a couple of cigars and some brown liquor and I had 13 pieces of art. But I didn't kill myself. And I realized in that moment that art is what spoke to me enough to calm me to not kill myself. And I've seen that in so many lives now in working with veterans that in get, get engaged in the arts and they find a place and find a passion. And what that does is it helps settle their mind, calm their thoughts and focus. And so seeing them focus on their work and having a passion for it, you're not hearing the things that you were hearing before. You're not seeing the things that you were seeing before. I've had 14 back operations, chronic pain 24 seven. When I'm painting, it, it's like it just goes away because I'm just focused on the work, focused on the work, focused on the work and excellence and passion. And I wanna communicate something to people. And I want it to be vibrant and exciting. But when I first started painting, it was all dark and dreary until I got into a program and I got help. I uh, work with uh, the educational system on both sides of the river. Uh, I work with the juvenile justice system on both sides of the river. Um, most of these environments are very keen on using uh, arts and arts education as a tool for making arts more accessible and making uh, different uh, aspects of our young people's lives more accessible. I mean, health outcomes from, from making art or being exposed to art or sharing art, I mean, you, you see it every day. So like if you're a busy commuter and you have to like take a train or something like that and there's art in in um, like the trans transportation station so like the train station um, that can help calm you down or just give you something nice to look at even if you're not noticing it and it might make your commute a little less stressful we take exhibits of work out into the public libraries we do it um, in coffee shops in churches um, anywhere we can take our outsider artwork and share the story of where the work comes from and 
create the opportunity to appreciate the artist and the art. You know, barbershops and salons, I feel like the artwork that we put in there, you know, are artwork that is, is that has life, that has love, that has beauty in it. Um, and that inspires, that uplifts, and I feel like that's good for the health. In the community, just walking down the street, walking through your neighborhood, you might see a sign that represents the cultural shift. Um, coffee shops. Where I go in my everyday right now, I see it on the way to the grocery store, I see it on the way to the studio, um, walking through the park. Again, if your eye or your mind is trained to see differences, you're going to see it. I feel like we encounter art more towards the, you know, downtown KC opposed mm -hmm. to anywhere else. I feel like that's kind of like the mecca of art within our city limits. When we talk about curation, which they never talk about uh, performing arts in the vein of, right? But what it really is when you put together a show, you're curating art. It's just live art performance. Uh, I've performed at graduations, bar mitzvahs. And yes, there's still even a space for art curation at a funeral. So with art and encountering art, uh, I mean, it's all around us, everywhere we go. Um, you know, walls are decorated with it. There's, there's sculpting out outside. We drive by it all the time. It's in architecture. You know, someone put the thought into the face of a building or how a window was constructed. Well, I would definitely say that inspire uh, is one of the words uh, enrich uh, would be another word. Um, um, I would say integrate, uh, broaden, and um, Enlighten. I mean, words to describe how art impacts health or art making impacts health. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of. I mean, you could start with inspiration. You could start with. Um, it's not one word, but you know, sanity retention. Um, you could say, um, you know, excitement, engagement, uh, conversation starter, um, conversation ender, um, inclusion. Uh, there are just so many. So many. So introspective and self-reflective. You can't make art without experiencing both of those. It's passion, um, love, freedom. You know, those are the type of things that I experience through my art. Uh, purposeful, impactful, glamour. Cleansing, introspection. I feel like it's pretty innovative. Merging of cultures. The fusion, culture. it's, it's basically like a derivative of yeah, culture yeah. making and culture yeah. sharing. Like vision, visionary, um, familial. Cathartic, engaging, revelatory, and energizing. So I'd say music, uh, painting, and videotography. However is going to be, whatever's going to be easiest and fastest for people to consume, because, I mean, we don't have a short, we don't have a long attention span these days. So um, something that's watchable, a snippet, something that may take a minute, like a series of short interviews, um, infographics are always fun. The, the age that we're in right now, just how social media is, and just the life online, and what we are conditioned to or what we're used to to you know watching and listening just videos you know just putting information out there putting articles out there um, for me personally I I choose to use video it social media has worked great and again even in social media we use all our own images when we're talking about youth programming in particular I think word of mouth is very effective Period. Like the best methods that humans have used, other than word of mouth, which is, you know, you play broken phone after generations, but I, th I think it's visuals. I feel like anything that 
is depicted in an image form like humans will absorb much quicker so i think that's probably the best vessel to like relay any type of information i think right now any kind of social media for sure yeah. uh taking a video taking a picture posting hashtag I know we have a lot of, like, we have different videos and things that are available for our families to be able to look at and resources, um, being able to go to events, you know, so when you're at an event, you can talk to the person firsthand and say, we have these types of, um, inf- this types of programming, this type of information, and, um, and that may require a pamphlet or a flyer or a signage that then would hopefully be able if there's a particular event that's going on and we have a sign outside of one of our buildings on social media has been a good platform to let people know about a health fair or to let them know about like a mural that's that's going to be um, working around and educating people on a particular health um, concern Because a lot of the programs we do are a result of grants that we receive, the grants are pretty specific about what they want to accomplish as well as measure. Uh, in the case with uh, the, the uh, health uh, system that hired us through a grant uh, to uh, get young people into the dental chair and develop the coloring book, which we then had a local performance artist reenact as a uh, theatrical performance that was being filmed uh, uh, as it was being implemented um, as a means to engage the young people at which point we eventually used that video produced to engage uh, hundreds of other children at various schools until we achieved our uh, grand goal of 450 young people uh, at the Samuel Rogers Clinic for dental care. So we use the actual uh, accomplishment, which was required by the grant of getting those 400 uh, young people in the dental chair as evidence of the success, as well as them receiving treatment uh, once they got there. That was the requirement of the grant, and that was what we achieved, so therefore we met the required measured uh, outcome. Um, Yeah, I mean... I would encourage people to, to always be asking que- or asking questions like how how do we talk about um, how do we talk about talking about quantifying this you know what language should be used what language was, is is best to use um, and then also are these questions being asked to people across different cultures um, and different groups um, because everybody's going to have a different perspective depending on what part of society they're coming from. So, you know, is this, is this, you know, just people in a, in a small network that are being asked or is this going out to, you know, the com- two communities at large? Because I think everybody is, you know, the impact of, you know, the same piece of art in the same place is going to be different for everybody. I think that video and storytelling are the only ways to really get that information out there to whether it's your own personal experience or it's an experience that you're observing. Um, I have struggled for decades now with how to measure outcomes of a qualitative program in quantitative terms to prove that something made a difference. We seem, we, we, we crave numbers. And I can tell you how many people have taken our classes, and I can tell you how many people have improved their skills by taking the classes. But I think the only appropriate measure of anything is really how was the life changed? And that's not something you can measure with numbers. That's something where you have to hear the story, you have to see the work. I think the, the different imaginative ways to quantify the, the effect on health, art and health, Um, is doing research, you know, just it's all types of research to see how people um, experience art, how it affects them over time. It's, you know, following people, um, um, showing them different types of art and seeing how that impacts their mental health on a day to day, week to week, you know, um, just different ways that you can work closely with someone um, and, and allow them to experience different types of art and just kind of see how, how they receive it, how they internalize it, and how that affects their life. I actually don't necessarily agree <laughs> with 
quantifiable measurements. <laughs> I think the best way to tell a story is to tell a story <laughs> in words, not in numbers, but that's my bias. <clears throat> so I'm a researcher, but I much prefer qualitative uh, in which you express your findings in words rather than in numbers. I think numbers can tell you part of a story, but you really need to hear the words to get the full story. Because all that quantifying gives you is statistics, but the story can get lost in statistics. Yeah, it's really hard to quantify. Yeah. And that's why, that's why I keep using the word empirical. Although I'm not the <laughs> greatest when it comes to like evidence-based research and, and, and finding you know, um, ways to measure success or effectiveness. Um, I, I certainly think that there's a need for that. Um, and I was talking about like the documentaries and things like that too. So I think that there needs to be a balance when, you know, all of these things, I guess in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking about uh, the decision makers and, and how different programs get funded and how you can demonstrate um, art and its relationship to mental health and mental health outcomes. Um, you got to have the data. But I like that question in that, like, then once you have the data, then how do you present it in a way that resonates with people on an emotional level? Because I think that's when you start to see change occur, when, when you can say what needs to be said factually in a way that resonates emotionally, um, then people start to change the way they see things. I think the best way that they can quantify it is just basically you know, do the research, like, like say for example, in this particular mural project that we just took part of, um, you can quantify the impact of said mural in that immediate area and how many PAD cases could there have been or, you know, um, how it actually dropped in the area where the mural is. Okay, and you can you quantify, I guess, like how impactful it was based on whether it decreased or not, I feel like. But I'm not sure if that's innovative. I mean, if there, I can come up with well, it. You know? There was a lot of surveys that were done uh, during the event that we had. That's true. So there was a lot of surveys. There was a lot of talking to the community. So, I mean, there's going to be results. Uh, For sure. And those results are going to be shown. I don't know when, but the results are going to happen. And I don't know. Th that research is coming from the mural. I mean, I think one of the like innovative or imaginative ways of looking at what researchers could do, especially in our art, like in our arts program in particular, would be to spend time. It would be spending years of time of being able to come in, see that same child doing that same type of program and work for not just a sit down one day or a sit down even one month this is because what what we want to be able to show is what happens right within these time this longer time period to show how arts can be such a positive and when you're looking at health or how a well-being of someone is you know that would be the only way for in my eyes of how to get a really good you know description or, or good end result of of that research that could be available. So for Poetry for Personal Power, we do a survey at the end of all of our events. It's an evaluation. Um, and at this point, it's, it's a pre-post survey. So we ask you how you felt when you came in, how you feeling as you're leaving. That's it. When we compile that information, looking at the types of events and categorizing it, we do um, publish that on our website. Right now, we are in a space of strategic planning and we are reevaluating, we are evaluating our evaluation metrics, right? Um, and then at the end of that, we will have like a booklet to be able to be distributed and also be able to distribute it um, via our virtual um, online platform. Well, I, to me, I, I don't think you get it off a questionnaire. I, I, to me, it is reading a body, reading the body language of someone when you're asking the questions. 
you know, are they closed off? Are they protected? Are they open? Are they sharing? Are they turning red? You know, are they, you know, people's dilating? So I, I think if, if they're going to gather information, it really needs to be personal. If you're, if you're wanting to find out how art has impacted someone's life, ask them. Like, get in front of them and have that conversation. And I think doing that with one person versus sending out 100 surveys, you're going to get so much more from personal interaction than you are sending out a piece of paper. Because, you know, a lot of people know you can sway a survey, survey one way or the other by your answers. You know, you can look at that survey and go, eh, yeah, okay, I would usually say this, but I'm going to do this. It's hard to pull that off in person when you're having that conversation, you know. And it just gets more in-depth, more intimate, and I think you would gather so much more information by doing, you know, what you're doing. Documenting it, videoing. And they can at least read my body language. They can see how passionate I am, how I get, when I talk about art, then my hands get going, and, and uh, you know, I get the goosebumps. That's the stuff you see in person. You can't see goosebumps on a survey. I think what's really vital is in uh, creative placemaking is a little different than just simply going in and implementing a creative program. Uh, creative placemaking does require the participation of those who you will present to. Uh, I think that it's vital that when you do these type programs that you have a process that allows you to engage the public's uh, input as to uh, the various uh, stages of involvement they participated in and what they uh, garnered or got from that experience so that we can do better at uh, interacting with the public in our delivery of creative programming. Uh, creative programming is more successful when you when you work with the people rather than to the people. But I'd really like to see, uh, in terms of art and creativity, how those things might be used in a way that addresses the the damage that is done to the human psyche. Uh, by uh, racist and, and white supremacist culture. I think that that would be particularly uh, important for us to look at at, at this juncture. Are oriented towards health. Why aren't, why aren't there more of them? Um, why are like, you know, researchers using billboards opposed to using muralists? So we need more community engagement projects that really involve the community and bring them together to learn about, you know, PAD. Um, you know, bring them in, help paint, and at the same time tell them, okay, well, this is what this icon means. This is what, you know, you can do to prevent it. You know, go to the next little piece. This right here is, you know, if you feel this on your legs or whatever. So yeah, more community engagement projects, definitely. I haven't looked at this year's budget. Right, but the spending budget in the United States, especially for research about suicide, uh, research about other mental health issues, very small compared to the research budgets of lots of other things. Why are we not researching our human condition with more fervor? Where is the money? Because how are we gonna heal us if we are not able to sustain the research, and then the practices that follow after. So that that is my question. Mm -hmm.